Well, at 6.02, I think we'll go ahead and get started. I, I do expect a few more folks to join us, um, but welcome, everybody. My name is Dan Macon, and I'm the Livestock and Natural Resources Advisor with UC Cooperative Extension in Placer, Nevada, Sutter, and Yuba counties, and uh, County Director for Placer in Nevada. And um, pleased tonight, we have Bianca Soares with us from Star Creek Land Stewards. I'm going to talk here in just a little bit. But uh, happy to have you on, Bianca. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I think we've got a, a good night. We're gonna gonna start with a, a quick poll and then go through a few slides, um, and then we'll uh, we'll jump to kind of a question and answer session. Just making sure I don't have somebody trying to get on that can't. It looks like we're okay. So um, just a couple of ground rules. If you do have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box. Um, we'll monitor that throughout and I'll try to answer questions as we go through the slides. Um, and then if you've got questions for Bianca as well, um, we can put them in the chat box and, um, and go from there. It's probably easiest if you stay muted with your microphone at least, um, just to make sure we've got enough bandwidth for all of this. I will be posting this, um, we're recording this, and I'll be posting it on my YouTube channel, Ranching in the Sierra Foothills YouTube channel. Um, hopefully by the end of the week, I'll send you a link to it, and, uh, and we'll also, um, also send out an evaluation afterwards just to get feedback on, on what worked well and what we could do different. So um, why don't we start? with this poll and there's just two questions. I just wanna kind of see who's here and, and what the interest is, what, what folks are doing. So it may take a, a second or two to come up, but once it's up, go ahead and answer both questions. It does work. All right. Looks like 10 out of 11 have voted. So I think we'll go ahead and close this down and see where we are. So most over half have sheep, uh, but we also have some cattle and goat folks. And then uh, somebody thinking about buying livestock, which we always like to hear. Always, always good to have more people doing this. And then the predominant um, focus is on reducing fire danger, but also interest in controlling invasive weeds and, and developing additional income streams for our businesses. So um, that is great. So I think everybody can see the results there now. All right, so let's jump in. I'm gonna share my screen here and we'll start um, with a, a quick set of slides, unless there are any questions before we get rolling. All right, so to, to start with, and this, those of you that have been to other business um, related workshops that we've done, um, some of this will be, will be kind of a review. But I do think it's start with the discussion of profit and, and why we're all here. Um, you know, we all wanna do good work, but I think profit's an important consideration to, to think about. And then we'll really walk through some of the economic considerations and thinking about this from a business perspective. Dave Pratt, who recently sold Ranch Management Consultants, I think hit the nail on the head with this. Profit's not the reason any of us are in business, but profit is essential if businesses are gonna continue. And I think that's a, a really important point to keep in mind here, that, that we're not just doing this for the money, but without, without generating profit, um, we're gonna have a difficult time staying in business. 
I think there's also some important considerations here between owning a business versus owning a job. I like to think of it, you know, I, I, I really enjoy working with sheep. I like building fence. I like working my dogs. I love lambing season. And those are all important tasks, but that's really owning, owning a job. And it's important to know how to do those things. But I think from a business standpoint, it's important to know how to do things like marketing and financial and economic analysis and complying with regulations. All those things that all of us who are in livestock um, don't necessarily enjoy doing, but it's really an important part of, of being in the business. From an economic standpoint, I think the first step is really to think about should we consider a particular enterprise? So, you know, we have sheep, for example, um, an economic analysis would really walk through whether, whether our sheep business should expand to do targeted grazing. Economic analysis helps us look at where we can increase profitability um, and really examine the weak links in our business. And once we've done that piece of the analysis, once we've done that homework, then we go on to doing the financial analysis. If we decide that a particular enterprise makes sense, then how can we accomplish those economic goals? And that financial analysis really looks at the sources and cost of the capital that we're going to invest in our business. It looks at the amount and timing of cash flows, both into and out of the business. And then really it's looking at the gain or loss of equity that we're achieving in the business by building, um, building our bottom line. A few terms here, just so we're all talking the same language. And I, you know, those of, of you that have taken economics or accounting courses, this may be a little different than, than some of the terminology we're used to talking about. But certainly all of us are familiar with gross revenue. And in the context of a, a grazing business, that's both grazing revenue and then sales of animals. And typically we'll have some of both. The emphasis may be a little different um, for some, but we'll have both of those sources. Then we have our direct costs and direct costs are those expenses that vary with the number of units produced. Um, we'll go through some examples here in just a second, but I think most of us can think of, of those kinds of expenses. Some people call them variable expenses that will go up and down depending on how many animals we have. Um, and then obviously we also have overhead costs. And these are, are what some economists, I think Erica Sanko's on here. So Erica is probably gonna school me in economic terms here pretty quick. Um, but those are, are relatively fixed costs, regardless of the number of animals that we run. Um, and typically those in a livestock business are gonna revolve around land and labor. And we'll talk about why a grazing business may be a little different in that regard. So if we look at the basic equation here, and I think this is an important step because we'll come back to this in terms of, of troubleshooting here in just a second. But if we have our gross revenue and we subtract our direct costs and an opportunity cost, because I think one of the things we need to force ourselves to do um, every time we examine a new enterprise that's gonna incur new costs is to say, I could do something different with this money. And that opportunity cost allows us to quantify um, what, what the cost of, of selecting this alternative over something else would be. But if we subtract those from our gross revenue, we get something that we call our gross margin. And um, we'll come back to that in just a second. From gross margin, then we subtract our overhead costs. And hopefully we have a positive number at the end of the day there. Um, if it's positive, it's profit. If it's negative, it's a loss. Um, but one of the reasons I walk through this really simple equation is because I think it's important for us to look at benchmarks here. Um, probably all of us have heard the, the maxim that you don't ask a rancher um, how many head of sheep she owns or how many cows he owns. Um, but we can talk about benchmarks and compare different sized businesses one against the other. So from a, a standpoint of gross margin, we want to make sure that after we pay our direct costs and our opportunity costs, that we're keeping 70 cents out of every dollar we take in, in the business and gross margin. And that's really a, a, a critical benchmark that tells us whether 
whether the business makes sense economically. We also want our overhead costs to be less than half of our gross revenue. So out of every dollar in gross revenue, we, we don't want to spend any more than 50 cents to pay those land and labor costs. And then simple math says that our, our profit benchmark ought to be somewhere in that 20% range. So keep those in mind and, and we'll come back to those, those benchmarks here in just a second. So some examples of gross revenue and, and Bianca, you might recognize these sheep in this, this part of the world. Um, but from a grazing standpoint, we're gonna have grazing revenue and there's um, a variety of ways that, that we can collect that. Um, Bianca will talk about um, the ways that they look at that. Typically, we're also going to have some sort of live animal sales, um, lambs or kids. Uh, we may have call ewes or call does. Some producers re re produce and sell replacement females. If we're using wool sheep, we may have wool, and, and then we may have some other, other revenue sources there too. Bianca, does that pretty well cover the, the kinds of revenue that you guys incorporate into your business? Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that would be it all, all okay. of it. And then I help, we also have goats on top of it, but pretty much, yeah. Okay, okay. If we look at direct costs, these are things, as I said, that, that vary with the number of animals. So it's gonna be costs like supplemental feed, um, vaccines and medications, things like ear tags. Um, if we're selling animals at the auction, we're gonna have marketing costs, and commissions on top of that. Um, we're going to be sharing if they're wool sheep. Um, we like to look at transportation as a direct cost. And I think this is an area where it'd be good to get some different perspectives on it. Um, but I think if we can put a per head cost on transportation, that helps us look at where we can gain efficiencies by doing something other than putting, putting sheep or goats in a gooseneck trailer, for example. Can you all think of any other direct costs that might be out there? Anything else that I'm uh, looking at? Bianca, anything that you guys consider direct costs that I left off of here? Um, no, that, that all looks pretty accurate to what we've got going on. Okay. Yeah. So then overheads um, for a grazing business can be a bit different than for a, a more conventional livestock business. Um, typically, as I mentioned, these are our land and labor related costs. Um, many grazing businesses do have a home base that either they own or they rent, a place that they can kind of go back to and, and lamb or kid, um, kind of get things back in order after a grazing season. Um, and that would be considered an overhead cost. If we're irrigating, that water cost is also an overhead cost. Doesn't matter how many animals we're grazing on irrigated pasture or alfalfa. Um, if we're paying rent for it, the landowner expects to get paid no matter how many animals we've got out there. Stock water, I think, is an interesting one that's a little different maybe with, with uh, targeted grazers. I, I think it, you know, you've got to haul water no matter how many animals you've got typically, but that could be considered a direct cost as well. Um, the more animals, the more the more hauling capacity you've got to have. Then on the labor side of things, there's not only the human labor, but also herding dogs and guardian animals and those things that are, are um, either making our labor more efficient or protecting our animals from predators. Um, and we incur those costs no matter how many animals we've got. Looks like we have an Andre Soares waiting to get in the meeting. Should we let her in, Bianca? I mean, if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then we've got also things like equipment repair and maintenance. Now, buying equipment is not considered an expense. That's a capital cost. But maintaining and repairing that equipment is an overhead. Um, depreciation is an area where a lot of us um, think about taxes, but don't necessarily think about the economic ramifications of depreciation. Depreciation is really a way to account for the cost of using up an asset that we're, we're using in the business. Um, and there may be other, other overheads in a particular business. 
but again, those are costs that don't vary with the number of animals that we've that we're operating with. So we're going to go into the grazing business real quick tonight, and I'm going to walk you through just a real quick example of of kind of how we would think about this. Um, and our our business is based on this graph. We've got dollars on the one axis and the number of acres grazed on the other axis axis. Um, but we've got a couple of constraints for this business that I think we all need to keep in mind. And you guys may, may have second um, thoughts about going into business with me after you see these assumptions. So first of all, we have no money to start this business. So we're going to have to borrow money to, to get started. We don't have any of our own money saved up. We don't have any time. We're all working in town doing other things. And so we're going to have to hire somebody that knows what they're doing to run the business for us. And currently we have no contracts or no land base. So this sounds like a great opportunity to me. We have nothing to spend, no animals, no time. Um, but that's going to force us to really look at whether or not this is, this is a valuable use of our time. So the first thing we got to do is go out and borrow money. Is that going to be have any cost to it? Is the bank just going to give us a check and say, have at it, go have fun? What's the cost we incur from borrowing money? We're going to pay interest on that, right? We're going to have an interest charge. Then we've got to go out and get livestock. We've got to get contracts. If we're going to have some kind of a home base, we've got to get the land put together. Um, from an economic analysis standpoint, even if you own the land that's part of your home base, charging the land rent to the business, I think, holds us to a little higher economic standard. So there's a return to that land as well. And then we're going to have to hire somebody to take care of the livestock. Okay. So all of those things, what, what category of expenses are those? Is that overhead or is that variable costs or direct costs? We've got land and labor, right? So those are our overhead costs. And that's this red line right here. No matter how many acres we graze, we're going to have to pay interest on the loan. We're going to have to um, pay for the livestock and we're going to have to pay somebody to take care of the, the animals. So we incur those costs and we haven't grazed a single acre and gotten paid for it yet. So then the next thing we've got to do is turn animals out on our projects, right? And so now we've got animals that are grazing. We've got to take care of them. We might have to put protein out if it's dry forage and we, we got to get them to eat the dry forage. Maybe we need to put some energy into those animals to, to get them to utilize the vegetation more effectively. We're going to have veterinary costs, whether it's vaccinations or, or treatment costs. Um, we'll have some sort of livestock ID costs. All of those things that we talked about in terms of our variable costs. Those direct costs vary with the number of animals or the number of acres that we graze. And so that's this green line here. It starts at the point where our overheads are and it goes up as we graze more acres or have more animals in the business. Now, we just got paid for our first acre. We are really cruising now. Look at that. We've got that blue line is now our income. We're, we're really doing it. What's the secret here? We got to get bigger, right? We got to graze more, more acres in order to make this a profitable business. And the reason we go through kind of this more simplistic exercise is because I think it, it illustrates a couple of ways that we can address weak spots in the business. So this blue line is our revenue. We start at no acres grazed and we go on up over, over, um, over the acreage. Our break even is that point where our expenses are totally covered by the revenue we're generating. We don't like break even. Break even sucks. Break even is not sustainable. What's that red area there? There's a reason I put it in red, right? It's red ink, that's, that's loss. That's where our, our revenue does not cover our expenses. 
Where we want to be is over here on the right hand side of this graph. We want to be over in this profitable um, portion of the business. And so that suggests that there's a certain scale, depending on how our businesses are organized, that we need to get to in order to be profitable. And it helps if I go the right direction. So a couple of, of ideas on how, how to troubleshoot. And I think, you know, we can do all of this planning on paper and, and the planning is important, but at some point, if you're going to get into this business, you've got to just start, start making the business work. So if we go back to this, this equation, and if I could remind folks to go ahead and mute your audio while we're, while we're on. If we go back to this, these, this um, benchmarking equation, the first thing that we're going to look at is our gross margin ratio. And we want that to be about 70%. 70 cents out of every dollar needs to stay in our pocket after paying those direct costs. Then we can look at our overheads and determine whether we're at 50% or lower. And from that, look at our profitability. So if the business isn't profitable, rather than just starting to say, well, we obviously need more animals or we need, um, we need to charge more, we really need to look at where those weak links are in terms of the benchmarks. And again, we should keep 70 cents out of every dollar. Overhead should be less than half of our gross revenue. And we should be able to profit 20 cents out of every dollar in gross revenue. So if our gross margin ratio is less than that 70%, if we're not keeping 70 cents out of every dollar, then we've got a couple of things we can look at. If you remember what grows, goes into our gross margin, we've either got to increase our total revenue. And there's a couple of ways that we can do that. We can raise our prices that we're charging per acre or per head per day. Um, but there may be other options that we can look at to increasing our total revenue. Alternatively, we can decrease our direct costs. What happens if we decrease our direct costs by cutting out um, all of our vaccinations, for example? Is that going to increase gross margin or, or potentially could it have an impact on our bottom line? We can buy feed in bulk. Um, that's one way that we can reduce that per head cost on, on our direct costs in terms of feed. Um, we can look at vaccination programs. There may be other alternatives for us. Um, and I think this is something I want to really spend some time digging into with Bianca. I think looking at those transportation options, um, particularly in this kind of business, can be a real driver in terms of that, that gross margin. The second place we look is at our overhead ratio. So if our overhead is greater than 50%, what does that suggest? I had indicated that overhead costs are typically land and labor. And so we can look at land costs. Um, for most targeted grazing businesses, this is not a huge overhead. Um, is there a different way we can get a home base if we need a home base for, for the winter time or for the off season? Um, are there alternatives for winter grazing or, or lambing or kidding? Um, there was a, an operation that I worked with some um, it was based in southeastern Washington, and they found that they could kid out on onion fields and, and do really well and, and actually have that at no cost. Um, and so that was an, an area where they were able to reduce their overhead. The other place that we need to look at is labor costs. So, you know, maybe there's some ways to increase our labor efficiency. Um, having worked around some of the the folks that work in Star Creek, I think labor efficiency is, is probably something you guys pay pretty close attention to. Um, but maybe there's, there's ways to increase labor efficiency by improving skills, um, by investing strategically in equipment that makes us more efficient. Um, our little part-time sheep business, dogs replace a lot of the human labor that we would otherwise have for doing some of the things that we do. And then lastly, if our profit ratio is less than 20%, if everything else lines up, if we're keeping 70 cents out of every dollar after our direct costs are paid, if our overheads are less than 
then we need to expand the size of the business. But we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't increase our turnover until we've addressed those other two benchmarks. So to, to increase turnover, to expand the size of the business, we can expand the enterprise. We can grow our numbers, um, which allows us to cover more ground potentially. One of the ways that a more conventional livestock business could look at this would be to improve reproductive efficiency. Um, there are costs to that. We can spend all kinds of money and maximize our lambing rate or our kidding rate um, and still not improve profitability. But, but that is an area that we can look at in terms of, of increasing our scale of operation. Um, we might be able to add an enterprise. I think this is a this is more of a, a challenge for a conventional operation that's looking at adding something to, to selling feeder cattle, for example. Um, each new enterprise is gonna have its own set of direct costs and, and maybe even overheads. But that's a, that is another way to look at increasing our, our turnover. And then I think the last piece in this, and, and this is a piece of most targeted grazing businesses, is um, you know we're gonna have lambs or kids to sell um, and how do we maximize the, the opportunity for increasing revenue with that part of the business as well? Just a, a couple of really quick considerations, I think, in terms of, of the production calendar for the business. I think one of the, the things that, um, that most targeted grazers that I've worked with have, have given a lot of thought to is what's the driving factor in your production calendar? Our little sheep business, our, our business is not based on grazing revenue. And so we are trying to match our lambing period with when we've got the most high quality feed at the cheapest cost. But if we were targeted grazing, that whole um, consideration in our production calendar would revolve around when we've got grazing projects um, available to us. And we would look in our part of the, re, of the, the foothills, we would look at annual range or, or grassland projects. And then we'd look at mid elevation brush projects as well. Um, and if we were gonna be doing grazing projects that season here in our part of the world is kind of mid February through the end of September. So based on that, then we need to think about when we're doing all these other things, right? If we're raising wool sheep, we gotta think about when we're gonna shear. Um, we need to think about when and where we're going to have lambs or kids hitting the ground and back up from that to when we're going to be breeding. Most of the targeted grazers in, in California uh, try to avoid lambing on projects or kidding on projects. And we'll talk to Bianca a little bit about that. Um, most of those operations are lambing kind of right about now. Um, and so that's a that's another consideration for us. Um, that also suggests then that we're gonna be um, breeding kind of while we're out on contracts. Um, and that's a, <laughs> it does make for some interesting phone calls on occasion when the Rams or the Bucks are turned in. Um, it, it definitely pays to have somebody that can do public relations for you. Um, but then the other thing that we think about in, in this region is, kind of when that gra annual grassland needs to be hit um, either for weed management or for fire reduction. Um, and then moving on to more of the browse projects that are, are in the brush areas of the foothills and then coming back to lamb or kid at a home ranch. So with that, um, I'm gonna stop here. Actually, let, let's, I'm going to stop sharing this. Are there any questions before I, I walk through the spreadsheet that uh, that I shared with everybody? Bianca, anything that you would add to kind of that real simplistic overview in terms of the economics? Um, no, not really. I think just make, you know, taking into consideration things like especially, and I'll touch on this later, but things especially like transportation and how that affects your business because of how much more you will be moving them compared to a typical sheep or goat or, you know, cattle operation. That's a, I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind as you're making your plans. And I think that's a, you know, that's another 
piece of that additional stress on the animals, perhaps that, that we don't take into account initially. Right. Um, which then factors into breeding and all of that as well. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to walk just real quickly through this spreadsheet that I sent, and I'm happy to, to sit down with folks on an individual basis and walk through this. But this is really set up for you to begin to play with some scenarios in terms of, of what the potential for a business like this is. Uh, the first tab here that I've got open is, is a livestock inventory. And I, I use this almost like a cash flow budget. It gives us an opening number and a, a closing number and allows us to transfer animals from one class to the other as they mature or are marketed. Um, and, and so this is a kind of a good start to, to build the rest of our, our estimates out of. The next tab here allows us to kind of get some estimate of um, how many animals we've got available to graze, what we think our grazed acres per day will be. And again, this is something that, that comes with experience. You're not going to know this early on. I suspect that most of the established businesses um, have a pretty good idea when they look at a new contract, kind of how much volume is there and how long their animals are going to take to get through it. Um, but this also suggests that keeping those records is really important. This also allows you to estimate how many days you want to spend on projects a year. Um, and we can play around with this. We'll, we'll maybe say that we're going to, we're going to be a little more ambitious and do 220 days a year on projects. So you can see that that adjusts kind of the estimated total acreage in grazing revenue that we're going to be able to generate. Then we can go through and look at livestock value. And again, the, the yellow cells here allow us to um, estimate weights and prices for what we're selling. Um, if any of you had both lambs and goat kids this year, you'll know that there was a huge differential between, between the value of kids versus the value of lambs. Um, but this, this allows us to look at both sales and purchases of livestock. The labor tab um, has a couple of different categories in here. And so the first piece of this is to look at what the business owner wants to pull out of the business. Um, and I think it's important to, to put this in up front. Um, we may not all get there the first couple of years, but it's important to, to understand that, that the owner should get paid for doing this work as well. Um, we put some other um, costs in there, self-employment tax, if, if you're gonna have to pay benefits, you know, health insurance and those types of things. And that gives us a total owner labor cost. Um, we can also plug in um, herder costs in here. And, and this is probably not entirely accurate with what herders are costing in California right now, but this is a contract herder um, through one of the labor services. And it kind of gives you a, a general idea of, of what that's going to cost. And then if you're going to hire somebody um, as an hourly worker, um, you can plug in an hourly wage and a, a um, full-time equivalent um, percentage here, as well as workers' comp and payroll tax. So it gives us a total labor cost down here, um, which would go into our overheads. The next tab is looking at our cash overheads. Um, and that would be things like fuel, um, utilities, insurance, and it'd be good to talk about insurance a little bit here, um, repairs and, a maintenance, and maintenance on equipment, and, um, and then all of the, the accounting and administrative expenses. And I plugged in a, a lease here. We're going to change that lease rate to $5,000. So that gives us our total cash overheads. We also have non-cash overheads, and this is mostly depreciation. Um, and it's, it's important not only from a tax standpoint, but from the standpoint of if you've got a set of corrals that you know you're going to have to replace in 10 years, you need to account for what you need to 
to depreciate in order to have that money on hand in 10 years. Um, we also depreciate in terms of, um, of the livestock, we'll depreciate any um, purchased breeding animals, herding dogs and livestock protection dogs as well. And this is probably a little high here, so we'll change that. We'll say we've got uh, three working age dogs. Then we go on to our direct costs. And this tab allows you to come up with a unit cost for things like um, supplemental feed, animal health, transportation, and so forth comes up with a total direct cost based on the number of animals, which carries forward from the other, from the, the animal inventory tab. And then this is calculated from the other tab. So it shows that we're gonna have $134,000 in grazing income, and we're gonna sell um, just under $28,000 in livestock in this projection year. And then if we forward here to our profitability analysis, it shows us that we are, based on this projection, um, we've got a great gross margin ratio. Our overhead ratio is a little high. So maybe our labor costs are a little high, or maybe our equipment costs are a little high, um, but we're still able to generate um, a profit under this scenario. So I'm happy to walk through this in more detail with folks one-on-one, -on -one, but I would really encourage you if this is a, a enterprise that you're thinking about um, starting to some kind of analysis like this. I think it's really important to, to look at the numbers. And I think it's also important having done this myself to be honest with yourself about what those numbers are, not to be rosy in your projections, but, but really dive into the, what the numbers are telling you. All right, one more shared screen here and then we'll we'll answer any questions that folks got a couple of takeaways um, before we get to bianca i think keeping records and monitoring your grazing per, per day by season and by vegetation type are really critical um, that will change from one year to the next i i think you know as you've been on projects for multiple years that's going to change as well um, scale is an important consideration. I think getting to scale is one of the biggest challenges for undercapitalized new businesses, figuring out how to grow. Uh, don't be afraid if your economic analysis tells you it's, you know, at, at where you're estimating your business to be, it's not profitable. Um, knowing the numbers is really power. And I think that's an important piece of this as well. Um, fix the most important things first, and then look at your timing of cash flows, cash inflows and outflows. Um, the next step after you've done this kind of economic analysis is really to look at your, your monthly budget. So with that, um, unless there are any questions to begin with, I think we'll, we'll dive in and, and ask Bianca to kind of talk about Star Creek Land Stewards and where you've been and, and where you are now. Um, Bianca, thank you very much for, for joining us tonight. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to be here. So start a little bit by, by talking about um, kind of how Star Creek got started, what your role in, is in the business and, and um, what you guys do, where you're based out of those types of things. Yeah. So um, uh, yeah, I'm Bianca. <laughs> uh, I work for Star Creek Land Stewards. It's my family's company. My mom uh, started it about, I think, eight years ago now. But I am the, I believe, fourth generation of Basque sheep herders here in California. So this is something I was very fortunate to get to grow up all around sheep. My grandparents still run a typical commercial meat and wool um, sheep company. So we're all lambing here right now together. It's been really fun to go out and see everything. But yeah, I, I was very fortunate to have grown up around the whole sheep industry and I'm way too obsessed with it, but it's, <laughs> it's really a wonderful, wonderful industry. Um, but Star Creek is something we started doing about eight years ago, I, I think, around that. 
and we do targeted grazing, obviously. Um, we have sheep and goats and we use a hair sheep. So my grandparents, like I said, have a wool braid. We've got beautiful rambolets, but Star Creek itself has um, Dorper, a Dorper breed. So they're a hair sheep. We don't shear them. They shed naturally. And then also like a Spanish boar cross of goats. So we do targeted grazing throughout um, central Northern California, a lot of work in the Bay Area primarily. And we've kind of started out working more in the East Bay and then now we're all over it. Some, sometimes we're in you know seven or eight different counties throughout California throughout the summer. So it gets pretty, pretty busy, pretty crazy sometimes, but it, uh, it's just, it, it's the industry is obviously growing. The demand is obviously growing, especially in years like this with so much fire threat and more and more, you know, public education on what works and how, like, what wonderful of a opportunity and option it is to use livestock to manage the, you know, our native grand land. Um, so we're, yeah, it, the, it, the industry is certainly growing. When you bid a job, how do you determine what you'll bid it? What, what are the factors that go into looking at, at a particular job? Um, yeah, we kind of talked about that earlier. So bidding a job is, is a complicated topic because it's every job is different, obviously. Um, we don't have like a general price that we use for every job. It really depends on a number of factors we kind of start with like an idea for certain regions of the state that we're working in each year. And then on top of that, we throw in things like transportation, which I already talked about. Transportation is huge because there's a huge difference between if a project is already connected or, or contiguous or close to a project you're currently on and you can just walk the animals down a road or um, cross the street or something, that's very different than if we need to bring in trucks or goosenecks and do like a 20 minute, 30 minute drive versus if it's a four hour drive and we need to use, you know, giant livestock trailers. So transportation is big. That is a key thing when we come to building a bid, that, that's a key factor. We have to think about how we're gonna get the animals safely to the next, this job. Um, things like water. So is water provided? Is there water on site? Do we need to get a hydrant meter? Um, is there a place for us to fill up our water tanks? Is it, is it, are, are we not able to use our water tanks? Is it too steep? Things like, you know, water is another obvious, obvious thing that we all would worry about. And so that also gets brought into it. Predators, especially, you know, do we need to have a guard dog? Um, homeless, homeless is a, another huge thing that we run into in California. Um, I, I try to avoid projects where, where I know that that's going to be an issue because it can, be detrimental when you're thinking about people that are um, potentially living in the space you've been contracted to graze. So that's one part of it. The other part of it is we've had many issues with um, people stealing the batteries that we use to power the electric fencing. Elect if electric fencing goes out and you're grazing right along the highway, that's a huge problem. That's a huge liability. So when you're building a bid, li the liabilities you need to be thinking about, that's one of them. And you want to make sure that whatever your bid is, your all of your liabilities are covered. So um, yeah, those are the main ones, transportation, water, and then, you know, your big risk factors like uh, predation or homeless would be the, the main factors, I think, going into it. And then whether or not you bid it per day versus per acre. Um, when we initially started out, I want to say we were primarily working with per acre rates, but now it really depends on the year. It depends on the vegetation. It depends on the location where we're working. Again, every job is different, but it's good to know as a grazer that you have both of those options and in, in how you develop your bid. You can go per day, you can go per acre, unless the, you know, the client requires one, one specific type. But that's another huge thing to keep in mind. Just a, an anecdote you were talking about, um, about electric fence going out. I think it was Easter Sunday, 2010, uh, the Lincoln Police Department called and said, we have your goats on the Southern Pacific tracks in Lincoln, and we're holding all the trains in Roseville till, till you get them off the tracks. And that was, I think I missed church that Sunday. I think, uh, I think yeah. we spent all day getting sheep and goats back. So. Those are not fun phone calls to get. Nope, <laughs> nope, they aren't, they aren't. So yeah. um, Mark has a question about what percentage of your jobs are public 
land versus private land, roughly? Mm. That's a tough one. Um, ah, that's, that's tough. I would, you know, the more of our, our larger, more, almost all of our larger projects are going to be on public lands. Okay. Um, most of our smaller size projects and acreage, I mean, would be for private, private homeowners or private ranch owners. But then you work in certain communities where you end up with, you know, five to 10 to 15 private ranches that are all contiguous. And the next thing you know, I've got a ton of private landowners that are making up a huge portion of our, of our projects for the summer. Uh, that's a hard one. I think it, it changes. It, it changes every single year. I don't, I wouldn't, I don't know how to give put a percent on that. Do you have a preference for working with public agencies versus private entities or? Um, not necessarily. They mean different things. So typically if I'm working for a private rancher or a private homeowner, that typically to me means that the land is, is obvious, is private obviously, and that there isn't public access. However, we do work in some communities where there are these large ranch owners that do allow public access for trail walking and um, biking and things like that. Um, whereas if you're working for a public entity, that's almost always public open space that's used constantly, especially in a year like this with COVID, everybody was out walking and biking and walking their dogs and running all the time. So those were very high traffic areas. When it comes to grazing, I would prefer being on, I think being on private land because we don't have quite as much of an issue with the public you know, being upset that there's fencing up near where they run or um, people getting confused why there's all of a sudden animals everywhere because they didn't read, you know, one of the 19,000 <laughs> signs I put up, you know, things like that. <laughs> so um, it kind of depends, but then you get down to like when there's an issue, say with, with interfacing with the public. And this is something I've kind of learned more recently, how important it is to communicate with your client on this. But, you know, when you can, I can call the ranger or I can call the city rep rep and be like, Hey, we have an issue out here. People aren't respecting our signs. People aren't respecting our herders. They have a little bit different type of responsibility to, to handle that kind of a situation. And it's not that private homeowners don't or private ranch owners don't, but we don't typically run into those kinds of issues when we're on a private property. So they both just offer up different things. There's more of an opportunity to educate when we're on pu public land, because you're having so much more interface with the public. Um, but on private land, it's a little, usually a little bit more low maintenance. It's kind of more chill for at least my herders, at least. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to gonna ask a question that's in the chat box, but maybe ask it a little different way. Um, do you approach clients or do they approach you? Um, it's a little of both. Okay. I think nowadays we probably are getting approached more by clients because once you start working in a certain area for one client, word of mouth gets out and, you know, the next public agency or private owner sees what's going on and wants to know how they get goats. Um, but again, like, in, especially when we first started out, we were definitely going out after bids. It wasn't so much that we were going to towns and saying, Hey, you should start a grazing program and you should use us. It's more like, uh, you know, they would have a grazing program. They're thinking of getting started and then we would bid. Okay. Uh, but it doesn't mean that that's not possible. I know that, you know, there are certain areas, especially nowadays when there's more and more fire threats every year, their communities are looking for how to get started and how to get a handle on, on managing that vegetation. And a lot of them just don't know what to do. And so if grazers are reaching out and saying, Hey, this is what I do. I think you should get started. I think we should try this. I think that there, I'm, I have no doubt that many communities would be really interested in starting a program in that way. And I, I will also just add, you know, the California Wool Growers Association has mm -hmm. a place where requests for proposals may be posted. Um, there's a new UC program called Match.Graze that is kind of a similar clearinghouse where you can, you can put information about your grazing business, but also hopefully entities seeking grazers will, will post those, the, that information too. Bianca, what's the smallest job you guys will do? Um, we don't do anything smaller than five acres. So five and below is kind of, we, we don't, we don't do those size projects. And that's because our average herd size is 400 animals, either just sheep, 
more often than not mix a mixed herd, but either just sheep, a mixed herd of sheep and goats or a straight her goat herd of about 400 animals. On average for us, of course, this changes every single year, but on average for us, we graze about an acre and a half a day okay. with a herd of 400. So anything smaller than five is just too quick of a turnaround. And we talked about how all that transportation affects the animals. It's just too hard on the animals to be unloading them there for like three and a half, four days and then getting them on a trailer again. So we don't typically don't do anything smaller than five, unless it's contiguous with another project where right. we could just walk them to it. Right, right. Yeah. What <clears throat> I'm, I'm curious as to, to how you arrived at that 400 animal um, herd size. Is that through trial and error? I, yeah, I would say so. I think um, we do at times get up to like, well, okay. So we have younger herds of like of our yearlings or, um, even like our two-year-old at times that are bigger than that. We might have like the 800 to 900 in a herd, but we found that, that quantity about equalizes to uh, what 400 older animals can do in about a day and a half. Um, it's just an easier amount. We can fit, typically that's the amount of goats we can fit on about four, depends on which herd I'm talking about, but about yeah. four gooseneck rides okay. or um, four to five gooseneck loads we can fit about that many. So it, it works out easier for us logistically when we're with deals of transportation. Um, and it's just kind of, it's a good amount for one herder to be able to manage. Once you start going up in numbers, then we need to like, then we wouldn't want to have another herder involved because the paddocks are going to be so much bigger and we're going to have so much more fencing to build. So it, it's kind of our sweet spot when it comes to building fence and moving the animals. Okay. So you're not, you're not over taxing labor and right. All of right. That. And we, and it's a healthy amount that we have found, to impact the land as well. We don't want to okay. overdo it on the land, obviously, because that's, we don't overgrazing is not something any of us want to be doing in this industry. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, another question in the chat box, do different municipalities or clients have different requirements for the contracts? Are you held to different standards depending on where you are? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we deal with this much more with public agencies than we do private. But, you know, certain um, municipalities want you to uh, like flush the animals out before you enter their project. So you can't just go from one project to theirs. You'd have to go from theirs to a holding space, do like a two day alfalfa, you know, weed free alfalfa flush, then enter their project. Um, some require a specific type of insurance. Some won't let sometimes we've been in projects where they will not allow you to have a guard dog which um, depends on where it is that that to me can be a, a deal breaker when it comes to, to doing a project, depending on where it is. Cause my yeah. animal's safety and health is very high on my list. Yeah. Um, let me think of some other requirements. Those are probably the main ones we, as far as transportation or yeah, th those are the main ones, you know, we have, we, yeah. Typically it's dealing with things like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But yes. They just, they all, they all can require certain specific things of you. How big do you think you need to be to justify hiring help or, or having herders in, involved in this? Um, I think it depends on what your goals are as a company. I think that if you are looking to expand, it's hard to do so if you're the person running all the day-to-day, -day, doing all the day-to-day -day work yourself. It's hard to be thinking about how you're going to expand, how you're going to go after those new contracts, how to do more community outreach if you're the person on the ground doing all the day-to-day -day work. Building if fence you're, for eight hours. Ex yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Because I can't imagine doing what my herders do all day and trying to get done what I'm doing on, this, on site at the same time. It wouldn't work. And if it did, it wouldn't work well. Yep. So if the quality of service that you're trying to provide is no longer at the, at the level you want it to be, then I think it's time to, to add some other people on to assist with you because, you know, at the end of the day, we're providing a service. And if my service is quality is not where I want it to be, something's wrong and we need to fi figure out how to fix that. And if adding labor is what you think might do so, I think as long as you can, you know, afford it, it's a huge asset. Another, another question in the chat box. Um, how do you manage around sensitive plants or animals or, or sensitive areas that, that uh, you need to avoid impacting? We run into this a lot. Um, that is something that, it, again, it depends on the project, but say it's a certain type of invasive that we're targeting. That might mean 
we grade, we need to know when that plant goes to seed so that we do as much intense grazing on that project as we can prior to it going to seed. And then once it goes to seed, we are out of there so that we aren't going to be mainly so we aren't blamed for when that seed does what it's already going to do and drop <laughs> and spread. <laughs> but, you know, we want to make sure that we're out of there bef before that plant goes to seed. And so we can't be, um, so that we're not the ones that the seeds attaching to the animals and being spread through their, with their bodies and whatnot. Um, if there's things, sensitive animals, like we run into a lot of issues with um, bird nests yeah. or some years we run into issues with frogs, but this year wasn't wet enough. We didn't typically have that problem, but bird nests are one. And so people, have the um, biologists go out and do surveys for them prior to us building fences in certain areas this kind of rule changes typically, but we have to keep like, a, I think it's a 30 foot border around depending on the type of bird nest, 30 foot border around wherever the bird nest is. So my herders and I and the biologists are in constant communication about where this nest is so that we are safely building our paddock around it or skipping it. Um, that's a, this comes up a lot when we work with a lot of um, public agencies because they're worried about man managing invasives um, stimulating growth of natives, and then also watching out for these sensitive animal species. I recall when we were working in, in Lincoln, where there were a lot of uh, planted oaks as part of their mm -hmm. mitigation projects too, that um, building a lot of wire cages and, and fencing a lot of oaks. Yes, you, yes. You know, we, out. yeah, well, young trees are a huge problem for goats because they love them the harder it is to get it the more they want it so <laughs> we so had you, someone yeah how do you decide whether you're putting goats or sheep in a project um that depends on the vegetation <clears throat> if so sheep are you know grazers goats are browsers goats like things nose level and up and sheep typically go for things nose level and down so if it's a big grassy area with mainly grasses a little bit of brush we may what we would most likely put in sheep maybe a mixed herd if it's a really dense, brushy, woody area with overgrown trees that are like touching the ground, then that's an absolutely, without a doubt, a goat project okay. um, because goats will climb and climb and climb and they will eat everything that you don't think they'll, they'll touch. They're going to eat it. And um, yeah, goat, goats can, goats can eat some crazy stuff. That's for sure. <laughs> Is there anything you'll turn down a job that, that you won't do or have you turned down jobs and why? Yes. Um, you know, when you go see us, I, I have to get eyes on a site before we're going to bid it before we're going to do it because mainly because in the back of my head, I hear one of my herders telling me like, what did you just sign me up for? If <laughs> I don't go look at it because <laughs> they're the ones on the ground putting up that fence. You know, if the quality of the feed is not going to be good for my animals, if it's, you know, in a bad location with typically with like homeless people everywhere, if the feed's not good, if the water options are like very limited, which, you know, a lot of the times we'll use a hydrant meter and get our own water. But if I can't really get my own water tank into my animals very easily, uh, those are the kind of projects where we really question, is it worth it? You know, and then. On top of that, that they might have some weird requirements and, you know, we're only allowed to enter. They only want us entering the property during certain hours, things like that. At the end of the day, my herders and my animals both need to be comfortable. And if they don't, if I don't feel that they're going to be comfortable where they're at because it's in a bad area or it's not healthy feed or, you know, there's other pressures. Those are when I, I don't feel comfortable doing a project because of things like that, because making sure both my herders and my animals are happy and content and comfortable is is very very important to making sure that the job is done well that's that's a that's a great point um yeah. and and kind of related to that there's a question about what's the youngest um class of animal you're willing to put out on a grazing project will you take pairs out on a project no okay no. and pa pairs if you're not aware it would be would be nursing females with lambs yeah. and kids so typically where grazing is done these days is in these um, more urban settings with people around people who don't typically have livestock around. So goats or sheep in general are already a huge attraction, a huge highlight. They are like the most exciting thing in town, especially this year during COVID. This, they were a hit. <laughs> the added temptation of babies on top of that <laughs> in people's backyards is just too much. Um we just, I, I, 
that is we, every once in a while, this happens every year, but there ends up being oopsies. And we have a couple babies that are born on project every year because some animal wasn't got in somewhere he wasn't supposed to be. We, we were call, those. Yeah. We call that where there's a ram, there's a way. Exactly. Exactly. And yeah, you, you know, but um, we get those pairs out immediately and get them back home because a babies can finagle away through fences much easier. And then you've got people calling you saying that there's babies running around and you know, they're going to get hurt. Or we've had people who, you know, pick their kids up and put their kids in with the pet in the paddock to catch the babies. It's just, it's too tempting. I understand I'm out playing with babies all day long. I totally get the temptation, but it's just too much of a risk for us. We, um, we won't do that. So pairs we don't have on site ever on projects ever. Um, young pairs at least. And then the youngest we'll do, we keep, we keep our, our yearlings home around Los Banos where we're based out of for the first year to make sure they're, they're electric fence trained until they get bigger. Because when they're small like that, unless you make a massive herd, their, their impact's not going to be great. They're not going to eat nearly as much as the bigger ones. They can't get as high as the older ones. And I'm mainly talking about goats here, but um, they can't, you know, they can't clear nearly as much. So we keep them home for the first year. And then second year they'll get mixed in with these older herds. We don't like keep one young herd. Our herds are pretty well um, mixed. That way it's, it's a better variety and you're eating more overall, but yeah. That point of, of having them solidly trained to the electric fence is, is really critical too. Yes. Really critical. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, how do you handle animal health issues? Um, whether it's a sick animal or a dead animal in an urban setting. Um, yeah. Um, it depends if it's a sick animal, we, I mean, it depends how sick, obviously. Um, you know, if they got into a little bit of hemlock, goats can almost snap out of anything. We just kind of let them be. We typically will, we have mocking, mocking, we have marking chalk that will mark a sick animal. So we keep the herders, we'll keep an eye on it for a couple of days. You know, if it needs a shot, if it needs like some LA 200 or something, they'll mark it and then give it a shot. We typically will keep an eye on it. Um, it depends on where the animal is. Same thing if, you know, if an animal dies and if an animal dies, we will get it out of there much quicker. But if there's some sick animals, we have someone coming up from Las Banas to all of our projects at least once a week, if not more than that. So then as if those sick animals are, are not looking good, we'll stick them on a truck and send them home. Um, and then we keep them at home, try to get them, you know, bring them back to health if, if possible. Um, but that's just something that you have to be ready to handle because again, if you're, when you're in the public eye, again, especially on a year like this year with COVID and everyone's anxiety and angst was like way up to here, people are looking for things to complain about. So, <laughs> you know, this year, especially being on it about managing your sick animals, honestly, of a huge, this is probably the most important thing anybody can get out of this. If you have red mar mar marking chalk, throw it away. <laughs> because it looks like blood and people will freak out and think that you've got bloody goats everywhere. Just don't ever, don't even buy it. <laughs> it's a waste. It, it's going to cost you more. But, um, you know, people in, in fact, when people see markings on animals that already don't look good, they know that, okay, some they're watching it. Something's being done, you know, being really vigilant and, and, and honestly over obvious about things like that when you're in the public eye with an animal that you don't think needs to go home, you think is going to snap out of it. It pays to just kind of spend a little extra time chatting with people that are walking their dogs or whatever, just to kind of talk about, Hey, yeah, it's not looking very good, but we're keeping an eye on it. We think it's going to be fine. If not, we'll take it home and get it looked at and blah, blah, blah. Do any of your contracts require vaccinations or vet certificates or anything like that? Um, no, I don't believe so. We have run into issues before with um, like projects that had been grazed by someone who had foot rot mm -hmm. prior to us coming in. And it was more that they had to disclose that to us. Mm -hmm. And so in which case we wanted to know how long it had been since the foot rot was there before we were going to be comfortable coming onto the project. But um, no, I don't think we've had any requirements for that. No. Mm -mm. Do you ever run into any issues with water quality or stormwater runoff and concerns about manure contamination or E. coli or things like that? Um, we, 
Not really. We've had issues with people complaining that there was poop left behind after we left. <laughs> um, we had this happen a couple years ago. Someone asked, like, called and asked my mom um, what we were going to do with the poop. And she was like, well, actually, you know, you're welcome. It's actually fertilizer. And then they were like, that's amazing. What a great <laughs> service you provide. Wow. Um, and then we hadn't really gotten much of that in a while. And actually this season I did have some lady email us like months after we left and just say, Hey, you know, I didn't want to, I don't want to cause anything, but I think you guys forgot to, when you, when you came and cleaned up all the poop after you left, I think you forgot to clean the hillside behind my house. And we were like, Whoa, Whoa, Whoa. So <laughs> it, we don't deal with much contamination issues. It's just kind of the general public in general that doesn't really understand right. that, you know, part of what we get is it, it is a fertilizing thing. We are get the hooves break down the soil. They eat the grass, they put it back in. It's the carbon cycle. Um, so that's more of the issue we run into. Not, not typically um, manure or E. coli issues because we're moving through quickly. You know, we're only in each paddock about a day. Yep. So we're moving quickly through it. We're not overdoing it in the, in the grass as far as grazing and pooping. So typically it's, it's not a big deal. And, and typically, in my experience in working with some of the water quality regulators, there's a recognition that that reduction in fuel load or, or control of the invasive weeds has such huge benefits in terms of water quality Right. that, that there's an understanding of the, the trade-offs there, too. Yeah, exactly. And then, yeah, in the cases when we have more pushback from that, it's mm -hmm. usually on our public um, projects and you can get the, the the biologists involved and then they'll come out ex and explain to the community members, well, actually, this is the benefit. This is what you're getting. It's right. not just little pieces of poop on the ground. It's fertilizer that's creating all of this fun stuff for the microbiome of the soil. So, yeah. 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 I think, I think we're, we've answered most people's questions. I have one last question for you though, that, that um, I'm interested to hear your answer. What do you know today that you wish you'd have known when you started doing this or what does the business know today that you wish you'd known eight years ago? Yeah. Um, well, I have learned a lot of things. I was like 17 when we got started. So there's, <laughs> there's a lot that we have learned. Um, I think two main things, and these are kind of connected, but one thing that this especially became clear again this year with how much extra pressure we got from COVID, but being comfortable asking for help from your client is something that I've really learned, especially this year. And I mean, in a way that prior to this year, whenever we'd run into issues with neighbors or, you know, walkers or people out on trails, I would really try to handle that internally. Um, you know, I have, I have a negative, a zero to negative tolerance for people being disrespectful or rude to my herders that doesn't fly with me. You can, I can put up with a lot myself, but, um, they, they don't, I don't handle, they don't take any of that for them. And a lot of times I would really try to handle that kind of stuff myself or, and it, it's not always a big conflict. A lot of times it's just issues with people not understanding what's going on or people that are not respecting our signs and pulling out and knocking down fences. But especially this year, being able to go to your client when, especially when it's a community, so you're working with the municipality and saying, Hey, we're having an issue with people knocking down fences. We need you to get out and put signs out. We need you to put a ranger out there for a few hours a day. We need you to do some community outreach and let your neighbors know that why there's 400 goats behind their house today, because apparently you didn't when you said you were going to, you know, <laughs> that kind of stuff has got, has become really aware to me. And in the end, it makes the whole grazing experience so much better for not only us, not only our clients, but the community itself, just because everybody is kind of on the same page. It, it really stimulates your client to be in, on top of their communication with the community. And that's another thing that's just been really crucial is making sure that, again, mainly when you're working with, with public entities that are having you graze right along homes, that they're reaching out to these neighbors and letting them know what's going to happen and what's about mm -hmm. to happen. Um, that that's something that I've really learned is really important to push on them. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, community outreach is huge personally for us. You know, 
where I work in the summertime with our jobs, I run most of our projects up in Marin County. And I try every day to be physically on the ground with the herd itself, not just with my herders, but with where the animals are for at least an hour with each herd every day, because the amount of foot traffic you get there, just taking a minute and stopping and chatting with people or answering some questions or seeing them watch you, you know, brush the foxtails out of the guard dogs or whatever's going on. It makes such a huge impact on the community. And next thing you know, you're hearing, you know, you walk into the grocery store and you're hearing people talk about the animals. And instead of hearing them make up stories like you typically hear that you're like, oh, excuse me, actually, they're here to provide a fire service. You know, <laughs> they're, they're providing actual educational information to other people in the community. And then that information spreads. You know, a tiny bit of education and a quick two minute conversation makes a world of difference in how easy you're able to work in that neighborhood, in that community. And that is something that over the years I have has really, really grown. And I have really put more and more priority into doing that. And, uh, you know, if, again, if we didn't have hired, if we didn't have herders, I wouldn't have the time to sit there and do that. You know, now my herders know when there's people that start now, they, people walk by and expect my herders to do the same thing. And most of them don't speak English. So they'll immediately call <laughs> me and I'm on speakerphone talking to a crowd of people answering questions. So yeah. community outreach is, is really, really important. Um, as far as making everything go so much smoother. I guess that for me, one more question before we wrap up, you guys have some, some really outstanding herders that have been with the operation for years and, and with the family mm -hmm. operation for years. Um, how do you, how do you maintain that kind of skill level and loyalty and, and really commitment to your business? Um, with, with that labor force, it's so important to you. I mean, I tell them this all the time, but they're, they're my number one priority, you know, making sure that they're comfortable where they're working, that they have all of the tools and equipment that they need to get the job done well, that they feel like they're, that they're cared about, that they're important. When all of those things line up, they're going to provide a way better service for you. Yep. Um, you know, we are very, very fortunate to have the herders we have. Most of them have worked for us for a number of years. And now we have, you know, like a father, father, a couple sons, nephews, brother-in-laws, you know, anytime that we're in need of bringing in more people, we let them let us know who they know somebody who also wants a job. So they all pretty much know each other. Um, but, you know, making sure that they're happy and that they're, they feel cared about and that they understand that we're worried about what happens with them it's huge. And, you know, like I said, I have a zero tolerance policy for people being disrespectful or rude to them um, is because they're the hardest working people. I know they're out there doing work that I can't do. And they know that. And it's really important to me to make sure that they understand that we care very much about how happy they are and that they feel important and cared for. Um, I, I know that there's a history of, there's a, idea that that is not the case with the sheep herder relationship. And at least from our business and my grandparents' business, that's just not, that type of attitude is not welcome. We we're a, we are one big giant team, one family. And if we don't all feel comfortable and work well together, this whole thing couldn't work. So they're a, they're a massive, massive factor in what, what we do and how well we do it. Every time I work, around around your herders or, or other herders i learned something that that makes me a better stock person too and I absolutely think a, a really important piece absolutely last, <clears throat> last question who do you guys use for liability insurance oh i wonder if my mom is still on here um <laughs> that is a tough one it changes i want to say it changes often let me <laughs> let me find out hold on a second <laughs> she's on she's on we'll unmute her, Gonna unmute her. <laughs> mom are you there, Hi there. <laughs> Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, our agent is Andrini and company out of San Mateo, but the actual carrier I believe is nationwide. And Andrini does a lot of agricultural insurance there. Yeah. They do a lot. I'll also of tell you it's getting harder and harder. Insurance companies are, they just this year, are kind of through a monkey wrench and things and are and are viewing our business 
at it very differently than they did at, at its inception. At its inception, they viewed it as a typical, uh, you know, livestock operation. Now they view it because of the so much trans because of the amount of transportation going on and the liability issues. They were in a different class now than a regular livestock operation. So, of course, that impacted rates. Um, so, just a little caveat about how that went, particularly this year. Yeah, good point. Good point. Well, Bianca, thank you very, very much. This was, was really helpful, really educational, and, and really appreciate your time. And, and Andre, thank you for jumping on there at the end. Andre is, is Bianca's mother and, and owner of Star Creek, right? Yes. And, yeah. uh, also vice president of the California Wool Growers Association. So um, thank you both very much. I will be sending out a link to the video um, by the end of the week and an evaluation so that we can um, find out, find out impacts, but also find out other topics that folks are interested in. And uh, with that, I, I want to thank, thank everybody for joining us tonight. Have a good evening.